So right, we're getting right into it now and I'd like to introduce uh, Dr Martin Holt uh, who was an Associate Professor at the Centre for Social Research and Health which was formerly the National <laughs> Centre in HIV Social Research at the University of New South Wales. Um, his research is focused on HIV prevention with gay and bisexual men. He leads the Gay Community Periodic Survey which is Australia's main behavioural surveillance system for HIV and the PREPARE project, a longitudinal study assessing attitudes to biomedical HIV prevention. Martin is an investigator on studies assessing the use and impact of rapid HIV testing, HIV self-testing, pre-exposure prophylaxis and treatment as prevention. Please make Martin feel welcome. Thanks Lisa and that was a great welcome to country. Um, so I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Okay, so when I was discussing with Ro Rowanna this particular presentation, I think I bit off a bit more than I can chew, which I realised on the plane on, on the way over as I deleted slide after slide. Um, so this is kind of sketching some ideas that have become really, really apparent to many of us over the last few years. In, particular in relation to biomedical HIV prevention. And so I'm very much focusing on that, and I, but I'm hoping that for those of you who work in other areas where there's increasingly a focus on biomedical intervention, and viral he hepatitis is a really obvious area where there's now an incredible focus on treatment, quite rightly, uh, but trying to think through what some of the social impact of this shift in focus is, given the opportunities presented by new technology, but also some of the challenges. So what I'm going to try and sketch out here, without much kind of thoroughness, um, is thinking. I was thinking about the major developments that we've seen in communication technology and particularly in HIV in testing and prevention methods uh, over the last 15 years. Um, and then thinking about how people conceptualise technological change when, they, when we respond to technological innovation particularly in HIV, but in the broader sexual health and BBV fields. And um, one of my frustrations, I think, in the last few years when there's been an enormous impetus to change very rapidly is can we actually Im improve our responses to new, new technology um, to actually um, have more beneficial impact? So can we actually learn from some of our mistakes over the last 15 years? I'm going to sketch out three areas um, uh, which I used as examples. Um, with Rowanna around mobile uh, gay men, gay and bisexual men's use of mobile applications, rapid testing and HIV self-testing, where I'm thinking, you know, and my colleague uh, Rebecca Guys in the audience, where we've done huge amounts of research in the last few years, but change seems to be quite slow. Um, and where change is definitely not slow over east um, around HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis and um, treatment as prevention, but I think it's interesting coming over here thinking about you know, the disparities in uh, access and change in those technological developments. And I am somewhat unapologetically just focusing on gay and bisexual men and HIV because that's what I know most about. So I'm hoping you will do some of the translation to your priority populations. Okay, so this epidemic curve will be familiar to many of us. Uh, it's annual uh, HIV uh, diagnoses in Australia, um, from the b largely from the beginning of monitoring in the uh, early, early to mid 80s through to the recent period. And one of the things to I always think it's interesting is when I kind of started out in the field here, uh, which now is getting increasingly a long time ago, um, but only in the last decade, I, I started out in this kind of like kind of flat period, which and the narrative during that period was of stability, uh, and it was very much like not not very much is going on. It's interesting that in the last few years we've changed the way we describe that, and we're saying actually we're now seeing steadily increasing infections nationally, and that kind of motivates change. You know, what are we not doing right, or what could we do better? Um, and I, that's kind of one of the things that is kind of occupying me at the moment when suddenly, you know, uh, when you're saying everything's stable, you're not particularly motivated to change things. And when you start saying, actually, it's not going in the right direction, suddenly everything is on the table. The next slide um, is very busy. Um, this was actually thinking about some of the history, particularly in research, some of which was, much of which was led by my centre um, 
in response to attacks on gay and bisexual men, uh, after we get out this initial period of lots of diagnoses and uh, lots of morbidity and mortality in the epidemic, and, um, but also the, the community-based response in, um, leading in Australia around HIV, um, around primary responses such as condoms, um, a bit of an argument around HIV testing and then uptake of HIV testing, um, needle and syringe programs and so on. Um, in, the, in the early 90s we see a shift where actually we start wrestling with well why don't people use condoms as much as we think, well they're pretty horrible but anyway, you know, um, why don't people <laughs> use them? And so this relapse debate emerges and then noticing lots of creative res responses to the technology that's available. So initially HIV testing, then things like uh, the emergence of actually properly effective treatment uh, and viral load testing, and then other practices with uh, noticing you know, uh, gay men negotiating um, condomless sex with their partners, usually based around HIV status and various other strategies. And in the recent period, we see a huge flurry of activity around international goals to try and you know, drastically reduce sexual transmission of HIV, harnessing knowledge about HIV treatment uh, prep and new testing technologies and I think we're very much in that moment at the moment. But one of the things, and I presented a version of this um, a few months ago at the AFAO National uh, Gay Men's HIV Health Promotion Conference, is that um, generally the general story is that we tend to notice things after they've happened in the community and then we try and work out a response to them. And do we want to support this? Do we want to say, no, this is a bad idea? Um, do we want to incorporate it into health promotion? But the one th thing to note is that creative responses in community to technological change and policy change are inevitable. That, so whatever we do, there will be a response. Some of it may be good, some of it may not be. And I was thinking, well, surely we could actually anticipate some responses now to the current moment. Apparently not. No, apparently it's all going to go according to plan. <laughs> it won't. So, um, so that's kind of like why I was putting that up. Okay, so then I started thinking about conceptualising technological change. Now this is, these are huge areas of theory and research and I'm no expert in these. Um, but one of this uh, paper by Timmermans and Berg I found really useful from Sociology of Health and Illness. Um, Characterising different ways people think about what techno technology does. And so one of the things we often wrestle with when a new technology emerges, and I'm thinking about mobile apps in particular, is that we think that um, there is a tendency to sometimes slightly negative responses characterise technology as having a very deterministic effect on people. So the technology is all powerful, it makes us do things we wouldn't necessarily do, it's um, a primary force and um, it shapes society and people. And there's often a bit of a fear-based response here around new technology. Um, in the field of biomedicine, um, critics can often therefore characterise technology as a form of social control. So we are uh, making people reliant on clinical care or drugs or intervention and this medicalises, surveils and cons constrains people. Bad things. So this is kind of broadly the technology is bad kind of approach. The counter, often equally problematic, is the social essentialism approach which basically says t technology is irrelevant and it's all about people and the meanings we attach to things and our existing values. Uh, but this is often equally problematic because it kind of says there's nothing interesting about the technology itself and how people interact with it. So that's kind of uh, not particularly useful either. And it puts all the focus on people saying that they have all the agency and technology does little to affect them. And I think this is naive and I think that's probably not our experience of what technology does. The more interesting approach, this uh, which Timmermans and Berg refer to as technology in practice, um, is of course inevitably more complicated, thank you sociology. Um, and it basically says that technology, people and culture change as they act together. So the problem is you have to kind of check in and work in so the meaning of the technology, the way it's used will change over time as people get their hands on it, get more used to it, uh, make sense of it as they act creatively. But it will also change, technology will change the people who use it as well. 
so nothing is particularly stable, you know, which is fantastic for a social researcher and really annoying for everybody else. And the key example there that I can think of is HIV testing. So it's a diagnostic technology. It was in the, in the control of the clinic. People didn't know very much about it in the early 80s. Now, the way it is used and thought about is very, very different. So particularly in affected communities who have high levels of testing, having an HIV status is, is a social identity. It's something meaningful. It can allow you to negotiate sex between your partners. This is completely separated from the original use of the technology. And some of that is revealed actually in arguments around, say, HIV self-testing, where one of the arguments is about, well, who has control over testing? And that's very troubling, I think, to people who are used to testing being controlled in a laboratory. And you know, the tension between move, putting it in the hands of people who are going to have the HIV status as a result of testing seems to raise issues around who should be in charge. OK, a couple of other concepts. So some of my colleagues who I've been working with in North America are kind of quite keen on this diffusion of innovation model. Um, I have some issues with it. It's, not in, it's kind of quite descriptive. It basically describes the timeline of uptake of technology. And it's being talked about a lot in terms of PrEP, for example, pre-exposure prophylaxis, about um, you know, how many people are using it and what will drive uptake if it is made available. Uh, and in the eastern seaboard, that is, seaboard, that is a, a pressing question at the moment. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about it is it uh, forces people to think, well, what actually influences people taking up a technology if it is available? You know, so is it because uh, the technology is attractive, people talking about it? Um, do they see it as attractive compared to alternatives that are available? You know, do you need opinion leaders to talk about it and to... Um, you know, to drive uptake, and, and what could prevent uptake as well? Um, when, you know, particularly public health or biomedicine see something as useful, but people don't engage with it. And I think here we could think about PEP, um, thinking about the conversation Sue Lang and I have had about post-exposure prophylaxis, which has been available for decades, and yet half of gay men still don't seem to know it, it actually exists. But if they go for it, Go um, and then there's some interesting research there about people's experience of going for PEP, which might explain why um, uptake is much lower than we think. This other concept has just come up in some conversations I've had recently. Um, also thinking about PrEP, uh, disruptive innovation. This is a concept from business and marketing, but it's often used in climate change and other uh, areas. Uh, and the idea and. and in popular culture, you'll have heard about this in terms of, say, Uber, like being a disruptive innovation. So it, it looks at an, ex an existing market and makes a pre uh, proposes an alternative which is supposed to be simpler, more effective, or cheaper, or more attractive, and it displaces the existing uh, practices that are there. Um, PrEP is very interesting in this sense because it's definitely not cheaper. Um, but it may be uh, simpler and more effective and more attractive <coughs> for some people. Um, but I think in terms of HIV, it's also thinking about, well, uh, what disruptive innovation makes you think about is, well, how will it uh, disrupt existing prevention, testing, and care um, practices? And I think it's kind of useful. And I've, uh, throughout this presentation, I've put some references. So if it's circulated, you can look at um, some sources on these ideas. OK, so I better get into the examples, because I'll run out of time. So mobile applications, I think this is a good, this, I've put this in really just as a, an example of how sometimes we automatically response, uh, respond to new technology. So I lived through all the kind of drama of people arguing about what the internet did to gay men or what gay men did to the internet. Um, probably made it look prettier or something, I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> the, um, the, mo the rapid uptake of mobile applications, it's been really n kind of privilege, a pri it's a, been a privilege for me to actually be doing research that can actually really see it happening. It's kind of rare, actually, in social science for you to actually see a change occurring before you. Um, and one of the things that's, uh, I guess I've got a pointer. Uh, so this is um, gay men who say they've met sex partners through mobile applications here. And this is from the Perth Gay Community Periodic Survey, which I'll be talking about later today and tomorrow. Um, and what you can see is this is a very dramatic uptake here where mobile apps are the, the go-to place to meeting, for meeting partners now. 
Uh, and interestingly, it's kind of it, it's completely disruptive in internet sex seeking as a way to meet partners. So internet sex seeking was sitting pretty for quite a long time, um, uh, but that has declined. And I've put a couple of venues uh, like uh, tried and trusted gay bars. I mean, you'd be hard pushed to find one in Perth, but apparently men <laughs> still <laughs> men still go to gay bars. Uh, and, ga and gay saunas here. And gay saunas, of course, are still of relevance because they are actually a much more efficient way to have multiple partners, if that's what you're looking for. Mobile apps and the internet, you may die trying to find a partner. Um, in, <laughs> but, you know, apparently per men in Perth are doing quite well. Now, what's interesting in the, in in the international field, and this was very well rehearsed with the internet, was a lot of knee-jerk reaction led by the Americans. They get very prudish about um, gay, men, gay men and sex, uh, saying, well, does do mobile apps increase risk? And often I just yawn, when it, you know, you just think, oh, God, not this argument again. But it's very much the technological determinism argument that uh, it's going to do bad things to people as people engage with it. Um, however, there are some interesting features about mobile apps which do, you know, prompt some thought. You know, it, they clearly do detach sex seeking and socialising from fixed locations and that can trouble people because it basically means that you can look for partners on the move or wherever you are, you don't necessarily need to be at home or, or at venues. And I think some of the interesting features of it and my colleague Kane Race at the University of Sydney has looked at some of this is you know, it encourages a new abbreviated form of communication between users and you've got to think there how much health information is realistically going to be transmitted in that communication. And it encourages new uh, practices of sorting, filtering and, filtering and profiling, which could be good or bad in terms of um, prevention outcomes. But of course, the question that the Americans have kind of put on the agenda is, do apps modify behavior or increase risk? Um, uh, and there's a, there's a broader question which I'm not engaging with here because I'm no health promotion expert, but I know uh, health promotion partners are really wrestling with, well, how do you engage men through apps? How do you engage men through this little screen in a meaningful way that might be useful? Now, on the question of risk, my short answer, which is ans it, we addressed in a very long paper, I apologise for its length, but we had to do a lot of revisions with it, and my colleague Peter Hull at the centre led this paper. Um, the short answer is we don't think mobile apps increase risk and the, and the easiest way to explain this is that when we look at men who only use mobile apps to meet partners or only use mobile apps and the internet, so they're very electronically focused, in the American public health argument you would assume that those men would have higher risks, more STIs, more condomless sex, more partners. Actually, men who solely rely on electronic media to um, meet partners actually have fewer partners overall, they take fewer risks, they have fewer STIs. What you actually find is that men who have the broadest range of sex-seeking practices, so men who go to venues, um, they go to private sex parties, they um, go out and about, and they use the internet and media. So men who've added electronic media to their sex-seeking repertoire. Strangely enough, they are the most sexually active men, so they're using the most creative range of ways to meet partners, and they're the ones who report the most risks. So if you wanted to take the social essentialism argument, you'd say, well, look, the risk was already occurring before the apps came along, and they just provide a new way to meet partners. So sure, sure you can use apps to find men who take risks, but don't assume that it's the apps themselves that are uh, creating risk. Anyway, how am I doing for time? God knows. All right, so <laughs> rapid testing and HIV self-testing. Um, so here, actually, I just wanted to draw some attention. To, this was my other point about resistance to change, and I really, really, this is more of a question or a provocation to the sector, having been involved in some of the very bruising arguments about even just trying to get the bloody national HIV testing policy to acknowledge rapid testing, and now all the reticence around HIV self-testing, um, you know, Rebecca and I and uh, particularly our colleague Damien Conway have done a huge amount of work trying to evaluate different models of testing and I know some of that work has been done here as well. Um, trying to address long recognised barriers to testing which people sometimes seem to be surprised still exist but like things, um, you know, very understandable fears of going for HIV testing such as, you know, fear, perhaps reasonable or unreasonable of getting a positive result, uh, people who don't see themselves as at, as at risk, uh, 
um, and, and also the inconvenience of going for testing, which had remained largely unchanged for about two decades, um, you know, causes real problems for people going for testing. And this seemed to be a bit of a surprise to people when the rapid testing debate came along. Uh, and Australia was quite slow. We were laggards in the diffusion of innovation model in adopting rapid HIV testing, although there is, I would argue, fairly limited access. Um, but you know, there is some access to rapid HIV testing. Um, and now we've got this issue which is sort of bubbling in the background about whether we should embrace HIV self-testing. Um, but there are some regulatory hurdles and pathologists don't seem wildly keen on HIV self-testing and nobody knows who's going to pay for it and all the, all the rest of it. But as I mentioned earlier, these technologies to me raise issues about control over medical te technology. So can we trust patients and users of technology to actually engage with the technology or do we feel that that really isn't their role and, and that medical and health professionals should be in charge? What do we think about peers or peer educators having control over technology? And then there are some legitimate issues about accuracy and cost. Uh, but as I mentioned, the proper uses of testing, what do we think testing is for? Is it for us to diagnose people? Is it for the people themselves presenting for testing? And what are we comfortable with? I would argue that in terms of HIV self-testing in particular, disruptive innovation, some people can see the attraction, but it is being resisted. So I probably won't go into all of this, given the amount of research, but I wanted to signal that if you want, it, the problem is not a lack of evidence. Um, we've been doing, doing a huge amount of research, and these are just some of, the, some of the research coming out of the Centre for Social Research and Health, and particularly the Kirby Institute, over the last few years, and there, and there is more research as well from uh, our colleagues and um, around the country. One of the things that I noted that got me started on this was that talking to gay men going for sexual health testing in particular was how their experience of testing was so different from the provider experience of providing testing. So provider models can be all, you know, best practice and warm and welcoming and we think everybody's having a great time and we've gone through all the procedures and we've told them everything and the patient can still feel dirty and ashamed as a result of going to the clinic and being surveilled and poked and prodded and being asked about their sex lives. And I don't know how easy it is to shift that. That's a long-standing experience of going to the clinic. So some alternatives which you have here in Perth in particular and Perth in particular led in, in this area around trying to change the environment of testing uh, and get peers and others to provide testing models. You know, these evaluate incredibly well. People who go to these services say they're highly acceptable, they feel really supported, and they're reasonably cost effective as well. Uh, trials we've done over east, I've learned that phrase from Graham Brown, thank you. Um, <laughs> trials over east about rapid HIV testing, particularly in Sydney, um, show that surprise, surprise, leaving with a preliminary test result, people really prefer rapid HIV testing over conventional testing. They do not want to wait for days or a week to find out <coughs> in the vast majority of cases that you're HIV negative. That way is very stressful still for a lot of people. Uh, however, the counter to this is that you know rapid HIV tests aren't as sensitive as conventional serology. And one of the problems that we're noting, noticing in the services over East is that if you advertise rapid services, um, you get people who've had recent risks, and rapid tests don't perform as well. So, you know, we have, we have fight a constant argument, in, we're having a constant argument in Sydney about the need for parallel, uh, parallel conventional serology, particularly for people who, it's fantastic we've got them through the door, but if they're saying that they've, they've turned up because they're worried that they've had a pr recent risk, you really kind of need to do the parallel testing. Of course, that's an additional cost. Moving on to HIV self-testing, there's actually been survey after survey after survey, we really should stop doing surveys on this, that <laughs> gay men really, really want HIV self-testing as an option, we're, we're, particularly those we're asking to test three or four times a year. That is a huge Im impost on them. You know, we actually want them to... <coughs> align with the guidelines, we need to give them a way to do it. And, um, and time after time, men tell us that they would like the option of being able to test themselves or their partners um, you know, in a, with something reliable that they could get hold of from the pharmacy or elsewhere. Um, 
Rebecca in particular led some uh, modelling which we published in the MJA which, which shows that HIV self-testing could significantly increase testing frequency among high-risk men and particularly infrequent testers, so people we can't get through the door because they're too fearful, they don't want to talk about their sex lives. Um, and I'm not prefiguring the results from our fourth study, Rebecca, because I know we're not supposed to talk about them until they're finished. But please come to the Adelaide conference um, later in the year where you, hopefully you'll be able to hear some of the results of a trial we're doing on actually when we give people self-tests, how much does it increase their frequency of testing. And these, are, however, this, you know, there are issues here which I think we should be talking about. You know, who pays? Do we want to support home use? How do we monitor? And you know, this is a, you know, these are legitimate questions. How do we monitor testing if it's taken out of the clinic? Um, and and are, are we accepting of non-traditional uses? Okay, so I'm going to have to rush, <laughs> inevitably. Um, as I mentioned, there's now a growing focus on biomedical HIV prevention, particularly uh, PrEP and treatment prevention. And most of you, unless you've been living under a rock, will have heard um, these um, strategies being debated and now increasingly promoted to affected communities, particularly gay and bisexual men. And you'll know that there's large-scale rollout in the eastern states and probably less so here and elsewhere. Um, the questions that I'm wrestling with are what do we think this will do to existing prevention practices, particularly condom use? Can we monitor impact? And, 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 and a broader question, which is a longer-term research question, this is hard when people want you to evaluate quickly, how do we think gay and bisexual men's norms will evolve as these technologies are embraced and used? Um, this is one solution uh, through the gay community periodic surveys that we're trialling, which is a different way of measuring uh, the impact of PrEP and treatment prevention on casual sex. So these are all men who have casual sex. And at the bottom, you've got the lower risk categories. These are men who have no anal intercourse. Condom use, still the majority practice. Um, this is, these are national data. Uh, but you can see that condom use has gradually declined over time. And this is pretty standard in most jurisdictions. And then up here from the light blue upwards, these are all men who have any condomless sex. But they're divided by status and whether they're on treatment and whether they're using PrEP. And the thing that will stand out to you is the red categories. These are negative and untested men who have condomless sex and they're not on PrEP because very few people are on PrEP at the moment. And in my view, the, the gradual growth in these two red categories, the dull red is men who have restrict themselves to being insertive during anal intercourse um, without condoms, which is slightly less risky, and men who have any receptive sex, which is the highest risk practice for transmission. And you can see that these two categories have got bigger over time, which correlates pretty well with gradually rising notifications. This tiny little yellow sliver here are negative men on PrEP. So in the last couple of years, we, we have seen men telling us that they're taking antiretrovirals for prevention, but they're a very small group at the moment. And the question that we have is what will happen? So what people want to see is this over the next five years. They want to see PrEP use go up substantially and it, to eat into these high-risk groups the yellow eating the red, and you can remember that, see? However, the concern is it will do this, that it will eat in, the net effect will be a dec further decline in condom use, and that just more men overall have condomless sex, which suggests that these men could then become susceptible to HIV. And the question is, for this very expensive and intensive intervention, will it have the effect we want? And we will be, uh, I have to say, early days in Sydney and Melbourne suggest it is going this way at the moment, so you know, there is constant kind of some work to be done. Okay, so in summary, uh, the history of the epidemic underlines that technological change and creative responses to it are inevitable. I think we need to think about our assumptions about the relationships between technology and users, um, because this, the, these assumptions guide our responses to the new technology and the things we research and evaluate. Um, Existing prevention, testing and care um, practices do appear to require innovation. Um, it's been fairly obvious for some time. And the good thing about the current debate is it's making us look at what we've been doing and think about how we could do it better. Um, however, there is a problem that we sometimes have resistance to disruptive innovation and we, even when we get disruptive innovations which we're hoping will have positive effects, 
uh, users and um, the technology users and providers are all likely to change in practice and head off in unexpected directions. And that requires some subtlety and some nimbleness in our research and evaluation. Thank you. Uh, we've probably got time for a couple of questions oh. for Martin. So, does anybody who. They're all starting to. I know, totally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a oh. roving mic, so. Um. Hi, thanks very much for an excellent presentation. I'm Rochelle, I'm the medical director of SHQ. I was wondering about the self-testing uh, that you were talking about. Uh, I can see that there's huge benefits for increasing rates and acceptability among and bisexual men. Um, who are actually increasing the rate of testing. I guess, is there a concern, um, like with PrEP, that increasing testing may not necessarily increase reporting and may not necessarily um, lead to contact tracing, etc.? Yeah, I mean, the, the research I've seen done overseas where, you know, it's more available, particularly the US, and then in other jurisdictions like France, I think it's now a bit more available, is that fears about people not coming forward if they get a reactive result are fairly unfounded. Like, people understand, you know, if you've got to think through, if you're going to go and spend money on a self-test, you know what it's for, and if you get a reactive result, you are going to want to know whether that's true or not. So I think that is probably less, um, less of an issue than perhaps uh, we think. However, in the back of my mind, I can just, th I can just see Sue Kipak shaking her white <laughs> bob at me, that people often, um, often think that test testing isn't prevention, in my mind, and that can be a bit, that makes people a bit uncomfortable in the current moment, but it isn't really prevention in the sense that when you look at large-scale reviews of men who test negative, let's say, uh, effect, all affected communities, people who test negative repeatedly, it has no particular effect on their practices. So if the reason they sought testing was because they thought they'd done something risky or they weren't entirely sure what they'd been doing or they'd had a lot of sex, testing in itself, while beneficial in terms of prompter diagnosis and so on for the people who get infected, who, let's face it, are a relatively small group, um, it's all, we don't really think very much about promoting testing about what it does to everybody else. And if it's totally detached from health promotion <laughs> and prevention, that raises questions about, well, how else do we intensify health promotion and prevention if we don't think about testing as prevention? Although I know many, many of my colleagues do call it an essential step in, pre in prevention. I will tolerate that view. <laughs> One more question, and we might have to leave it there. Just wondering, uh, with the concern about risk compensation and with PrEP, uh, I'm, concerned, I'm thinking about places where maybe it's much further along um, down the track, like San Francisco, yep. and um, decreasing HIV rates there. And I suppose um, the two things I'm considering and would like you to comment on maybe are that PrEP generally is most acceptable and most sought after by the highest risk group. And if it's widely available, such as a setting like San Francisco, and it's gone through the kind of you know community outrage and come out the other end, um, it seems to be not going in that direction of sort of um, you know in increased risk or at least no reduction in risk. Yeah. So one of the things I want to put on the agenda is that the risk compensation argument from largely from clinical and public health researchers around PrEP has generally been focused on people using PrEP, which I think is the wrong focus entirely, because if you believe it works and people take it, well, who cares if, if they have more condomless sex? Because to be eligible to take it, you probably were having condomless sex to begin with. So it all seems a bit mad to me that we're worrying about whether people are having more or less condomless sex when we were giving them the intervention because they were having condomless sex. Anyway, you know, it seems a bit stupid. The slide that I was showing there with the... Um, it doesn't matter, I can't go back to it now. With the, is actually the, about a community level. So it's about whether m other people, not on PrEP, then start using condoms less because they're meeting people who are not using condoms because they're on PrEP. And I think that's been completely missing in evaluations. Now, in San Francisco, 
The other thing to note is San Francisco's epidemiology is so wildly different from any other city in Australia and most of the US actually. HIV prevalence has been so much higher there for many, many decades. But also they were having declining numbers of infections like over 10 years ago. Not something we're seeing here. So everything they've added to the response, whether rapid treatment or you know, much greater access to testing, not really prevention, but anyway, um, connection to care, um, which was I think the major barrier in San Francisco, and now PrEP, has just helped the downward decline. We're starting with numbers still going up. So you've got to think about on a country level, what do we have to do to get numbers to go down? And in San Francisco, the emergent behavioral data, and their behavioral data systems are just not as, they're just not as good as ours. They don't collect as often, do actually suggest some community, community level change. So they show the uptake of PrEP, and which is acceptable to you know, men at high risk, and people are accepting it in the city, but they're also showing other men having more condomless sex as well. Now they're getting away with it because numbers are going down. So, but the question is here, if our numbers are going up and we get that uh, shift in behavioural practice, will it have the effect we want it to? That's my question and concern. While being a PrEP supporter, please let it be more available. Um, before it makes it sound like I'm a complete sceptic.